These techniques, if exercised every day, not just they will make you a disciplined man by creating new habits to you, but they will make you manifest many, many things towards your life very, very fast. Do not miss these four steps, four techniques that will bring you abundance into your life. Hello guys, welcome back to another video. I just decided today to share with you an amazing technique that I did and that helped me every day. You know, Neville taught many techniques to make it easy for us. He didn't uh, go deep into any particular technique to elaborate, but he wanted us to find one of his techniques and the right technique that suits us best. Because people are different to each other. Not the same technique will suit everyone. Not everyone will find himself uh, with the same technique or will manifest with the same technique. I might find myself with a breathing technique. Someone might find himself with uh, the revised technique. So everyone choose the right, the best technique for themselves. Also, Neville didn't mention any particular time on how long to do the exercise in order to manifest it faster. And that's why I'm giving you one of the best techniques that helped me a lot to manifest some things into my life. It only takes 5 minutes, 5 gold minutes into having the dream of your life in your hands. So let's start. Here are the 5 steps elaborated each one. And the first step is relaxation. You know, just before going into meditation, First, you need to prepare yourself. You need to make yourself ready for the process. You, you can't just go, oh, I'm gonna meditate now. You are tired and you are angry and stressed on something. No, it just doesn't work like that. First, you need to find a quiet place and it needs to be comfortable to sit and lie down. Close your eyes and take a few deep breaths to relax your body and mind. Release any tension or stress. Clear all your thoughts and become present in the moment. You need to do this for one minute and when you are ready, you go into the second step. So in this first step, all you need to do is relax, lie down, close your eyes and make yourself ready to go into the second step. The second step is visualization. This step will also take one minute to do it. Now, in this step, you gotta challenge yourself. You gotta find for yourself the thing that you want to, to have into your life. Name the specific thing that you want to manifest. Close your eyes and visualize your desired outcome and imagine it as it has already happened, as it is already yours. See yourself experiencing and enjoying the outcome. Visualize the thing as vividly as possible. Use all your senses to make the visualization as real as possible. Feel the emotions associated with achieving your desire. And that's it for the second step. The third step is affirmation. Now, when we are at the affirmations, you need to find or state a positive affirmation related to your manifestation goal. For example, I am now experiencing and you name your desired thing immediately after I am now experiencing. Or I am happy and grateful now that I have. And you name your desired thing. Or people are now loving my new and you name your desired thing. Repeat this affirmation with conviction, believing that it is already true. This takes just one minute. And the fourth step is gratitude. What you need to do in this step is express gratitude for receiving your desire. Always be thankful for things that you want to have. Feel thankful for the manifestation even though it hasn't physically happened yet. Feel the emotions of gratitude deeply. The key here is to genuinely feel grateful. So I'm gonna repeat one more time the four steps that you need to remember in this video. The first step was relaxation. Just relax, lie down or sit in a comfortable chair and close your eyes and make yourself ready for the second step. The second step was visualization. Visualization meaning that you need to find your desire, you need to find the thing that you want to visualize during this step. The third step is affirmation. You need to find the right affirmation that is related to your goal and repeat that over and over again. And the fourth step is gratitude. You feel thankful and grateful for things that you, you want to manifest and you feel grateful that you have it already. After doing these four important steps, now you need to go into another three smaller steps. The first one is release. And you need to let go any attachment to the outcome. Let all you have done in secret, in visualization, let it go. Trust that your subconscious mind 
is working to bring your desire to you. Release any doubts or worries. Second step is confidence. Feel confident and certain that your desire is on its way. Trust in the process and your ability to manifest what you want. Feel confident that your desire may come tomorrow. There is no exact time on manifestation on when your desire is going to come. It may come tomorrow, it may come today or after one month. You, you never know. After doing this, we're going into the third step. Open your eyes and return to the present moment with a positive and confident mindset. Knowing that what you did into these five minutes is not a dream. It is already your reality. It is already your life. And then go your way. Continue your day where you left. Start doing what you, what you have on plan to do. And do not take any moment thinking that your desire is not gonna come. Start doing what you haven't planned to do and do not take any moment to think that your desire is not gonna come because of this or because of that. When such thoughts come to you, just change it. Take immediately action and change it and bring back your desired state. Because you don't need to know why you can't have something, why you can't have your reality into your world. You can't doubt what you just felt as true. Okay guys, that's it for this video and uh, in this video I explain the four techniques that just take five minutes into your day to manifest what you want in life. Okay guys, if you made till the end and if you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment below and thanks for watching. It's not just to entertain an idea. What idea? The idea must produce in you this feeling which is a sensation, but it must be a feeling. What would the feeling be like if it were true? You dwell upon that until you catch that feeling. As Churchill said, that the mood determines the fortunes of people rather than the fortunes, the mood. The mood precedes the fortune. So what would you want in this world? Well, contemplate it. What would the feeling be like if you had it? What would it be like if it were true? You can do it. There is no flower in your hand, but you can feel the soft velvet feeling of a rose. You can smell a rose, though it's not physically present. Try it. Try all these things with the inner man. And when you can actually feel it, so that you raise your imagination to the point of sensation, to vision, and the whole thing is done. It's done in a way you do not know it's going to happen. So tonight you want a bigger job, you want more money in this world, you want, and you name it. Well then, it may be a thief who is going to aid you in the getting without knowing he's doing it. Don't judge him, don't condemn him, just simply you go forward knowing that I have ways and means that the physical man knows not of. My ways, the inner man's ways, are past finding out. And you simply go forward in the assumption that you have already achieved what now is only a wish as far as the world is concerned. But you enter into the wish as though the wish is already fulfilled. So tonight is a practical night. Do you know this night what you want? Really what you want? Do what I did when I was locked out completely from marrying the girl I wanted to marry. I simply assumed that she slept there, I slept here, and I went sung to sleep, and in one week, my wife did an act which certainly I must forgive, in the eyes of the world, she is condemned for taking what she did not pay for. And yet because of that act, I got my freedom. Then who is the culprit? Am I not? If there is any culprit, I am. If there is any culprit in this world, it is God. There is nothing but God. God is doing all in this world. He created everything in this world. And so I, if in me he is the second man, and the second man is my imagination, and that is God. 
For man is all imagination, and God is man, and exists in us, and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination, and that is God himself. Well, if, if I in my imagination slept as though I am happily married to a girl that the laws of New York State said I could never get because of my entanglement with my first wife. And in one week, she performed an act which was judged harshly by society. And yet she was the instrument of my getting my freedom to marry the girl who now is the mother of my daughter. So how can I blame her who performed that act? She was in a state, and who did it? I did it. I did it by simply assuming that I was free and happily married to a girl that the state of New York said I could never marry because of the ancient laws that restricted my desire to get freedom in that state. So you forgive everyone in this world. You're all playing their part. So in my own case, I have seen thieves, I have seen all kinds of people play their part. They were instruments in the fulfillment of my desire. So how can I ever condemn all? So tonight, you just simply boldly declare that you are the man. You are the woman that you want to be. I walk in that assumption as though it were true. And then let all these sleeping states play their part. May I tell you, in spite of what they appear to be, they are sound, sound asleep. For God plays all the parts in the world. There is nothing but God. And say, I am, that's God. That is the Lord Jesus within you. That is your immortal being that cannot die. He cannot die. That is your eternal self when you say, I am. Imagination is not some vague essence. It is a body, a reality, an infinite body that is so perfect when it's awakened that in its presence everything is made perfect. But while it is awakened, it exercises that power and draws into its world everyone that can play the part for its fulfillment of its dream. So here, I hope you heard it clearly. I hope I've made it as clear as I can, because tonight should be a very practical night. That you will go out knowing who you are. You are a dual being. But the first man is of the dust, and to dust he returns. That is the man of earth. The second man is the Lord from heaven, and he cannot die. That's your own wonderful human imagination. It cannot die. But it sleeps. It sleeps embodied in this tomb. And one day it will awaken. As I've told you in the past, the symbolism of scripture will surround you. It's perfect. It is true. Everything told you in scripture as to his birth, you are going to experience. And then your imagination awakens. And you trust no one but it. Only this being within you do you really worship. We are the reality. We are the gods. We are the gods that came down into this world. And here we are now entombed in the very body that we penetrated and annexed its brain. And there we are, dreaming this dream of life. If I know I am dreaming it, I can control the dream. If I know I am dreaming it. But a man dreaming doesn't know that he's dreaming. The minute he knows he's dreaming, he wakes. You can prolong a dream if you know how to control it. But usually when a man discovers he's dreaming, he wakes. And he returns here. And he will say to himself, oh, it was only a dream. The day will come, you will know this is a dream. And you will awake. But that waking will be something entirely different from the kind of awakening 
when you wake on a morning and find yourself on the bed where you fell asleep the night before. That other waking will be something entirely different. When you actually awake within yourself to discover that you really are the Lord Jesus Christ. I am telling you what I know from experience. Everyone in this world is going to have that experience. For your true being is God. Not something on the outside. The God in you, now entombed in the body that you, in your descent, penetrated and annexed its brain. And do not let anyone tell you that the descent as you descended, what an adventure. And annexed the brain of the body you now wear, that that is less wonderful than what you're going to experience when you ascend and you penetrate and annex the brain of the heavenly man. That ascent is as real as anything you've ever dreamed in this world. It comes the moment that you are torn in two. In scripture, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then he took with him, not the blood of an animal, the blood of a goat, a lamb, a sheep. He took his own blood through the curtain into the holy of holies. And he tells you how it happened. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And when you are split in two from top to bottom, and that curtain which is your own flesh parts, and you see the two halves of your body, and you are the observer, and when you look at it, and you see at the base a golden, living, liquid light, and you know it is yourself. That's the, own, the blood that you had shed to come down here. And you fuse with it. And then like some fiery serpent. Up you go into the brain. You penetrate it. And here you annex it. And you become one with that heavenly man. And you wear it as your own body. You are then the risen Lord. And everyone's going to enter into that one body by one spirit. And he will be the one God and father of all. And everyone will be that one God and father of all. You and I who came down as brothers in this fantastic venture. I tell you what I know. I'm not speculating. The day will come and tonight you think you're completely insane. It would make no difference to me whatsoever. Because I know you're going to have the experience. And you're going to know how true it is. Everyone in this world. But while we have penetrated and annexed the brain of the body we now wear, we are now confronted with all the vicissitudes entailed by that annexation. It contains within itself certain restrictions, certain horrors. But we penetrated it we appropriated it, we annexed it. When America annexed California, it had to accept the happenings in California as incidents within itself. Just a few weeks ago, you thought maybe America regretted it and tried to shake it off into the Pacific. It tried to burn it last year, then tried to flood it out and then try it now to wind it out, and then to shake it out. But it is still part of that body. They annexed it, and they must now actually accept all the happenings in it as incidents within itself. And so as long as I wear this body, with all the weaknesses of my so-called forefathers, anything built into it based upon what the physical so-called descent entails I have to endure everything because I penetrated it annexed it and I wear it 
and now it becomes a temporary part of my soul. And I am soul. I am all imagination. I am the being spoken of in Scripture as the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the being spoken of in Scripture as Jehovah, and so are you. Every child born of woman is the same being. Not one is greater than the other. We are the sons of God who came down into this world. And we ventured and we penetrated and annexed the brains of the bodies we now wear. Animating them. For well, they're all dead. Now I tell you they were dead. It seemed as though they were not, but they were dead. If you saw them as I see them, they're all still like statues. Now let me share with you a letter that came to me yesterday. The lady and her husband are here tonight. They're here all the time. She said, you closed on the 11th of December. Well, this happened on the 7th, the lecture before the last. It was a Monday night. And you were simply using the 14th chapter of the book of John. And suddenly, at the, almost the very end of your lecture, I found myself standing in a huge temple, standing at the entrance. I was about to leave, and I thought I would simply take one more look at the interior of this temple, because I was about to depart. As I looked in, every wall had two columns, and then a door leading through the columns. They're all equally spaced, and in front of the doorway, which led out, there was a statue. And I knew, she said, that I could put that statue on as I would a garment. But I knew if I did, I would have to experience all that was contained within that statue. But I also knew I had already done it. All these I had played. They were all individual statues at the doorway between the two columns. And there were simply many doorways within the interior of this huge, huge temple. And then I felt what enormous satisfaction that I have done it. I have completed the work that I came to do. And then I came back to the lecture. And then the lecture was almost over. That night when we went home, my husband and I put on the tape. And I knew when I had dropped from hearing you audibly hear and found myself standing at the entrance, departing from this enormous, huge temple. For I make notes as you speak, and the last note I made was this. He is not the God that he wore. That's the last thing I wrote down. All is spirit. And then I came back. You spoke beyond that, but I had no notes beyond that. That was my last note. So when you said, he is not the garment that he wore, it was then that I found myself standing in the entrance to this huge, huge temple. And these statues, and every one was something I could have worn as easily as I now wear a dress. And then I realized I have worn them. I have played all of this. I don't have to replay them. I have played them. I have experienced everything that they can give to anyone, leaving them there for anyone else to experience it. I can thank you now for that. What a wonderful vision, and may I tell you how true it is. When you see these things in eternity, the whole thing is done. It's a play. But you and I are the actors. God only acts and is in existing beings or men. Well, the actor in you is your own wonderful human imagination. That's the actor. That's God. And God only acts. Now, he actually puts on these garments. He puts them on by penetrating and annexing the brain of the garment he is going to wear. But within that garment, there are limitations and horrors, and all kinds of things. And then I am confronted with all the vicissitudes 
entailed by that annexation. And so I've got to go through it. So my mother died at 61, my father died at 85. Say he drank heavily and she didn't drink. And all these things, and all of a sudden the scientists tell you that this is your background physically. All right, let them tell me all they can. I am actually in tune in this, wearing the restrictions of this garment, but having discovered who I am, I can modify it. I have seen a dozen Hamlets, and no two are played alike. All they stick to the script, and they depart on time. They take their cue and they enter on time, but they interpret it differently. And so I can take a part. And knowing who I am, that I am the actor, that I am not the thing that I am playing. I am the actor playing a part. Well, if I know I am, then I can modify the drama. I can interpret it differently without changing the words of the author. I will come in on cue as I did, and I will depart on cue. And no one's going to extend my days one iota. As we are told in Scripture, who by taking thought can add one hour to his span of life. Not one hour. It used to be interpreted, not in a temporal sense, but in a spatial sense. Who by taking thought could add one cubit, which means 30 inches, to his stature. It isn't that any longer. We have discovered that was not the true interpretation of it. It is who by taking thought, or who by being anxious, can add one hour to his span of life. You come on time, you depart on time. But in that interval, you can make it a rich and wonderful life. Today, I'm going to talk about the law of reversibility, how it works, and how you can use it to manifest in your life. I will start this video with a quote from Tennyson that says, Pray for my soul, and more things are brought to you by prayer than this world dreams of. Prayer is an art, and it requires practice, but more importantly, it requires a controlled imagination, so there is no place for vain repetitions. It requires exercise, tranquility and peace of mind. Most of people, they practice prayer as a ceremony, as they are so ignorant about it, they forgot that prayer is about feeling, is about spirit. The essence of prayer is faith, but faith must be permitted with understanding to be given that active quality which it does not possess when not understanding. We know that whether or not man succeed in reversing the transformations of a force, nevertheless, that all transformations of force are reversible. For example, if heat can produce mechanical motion, also mechanical motion can produce heat. If electricity produces magnetism, also magnetism can develop electric currents. If the voice can cause undulatory currents, so can such currents reproduce the voice and so on. So this is how we can understand the law of reversibility in manifestation. If we want something, we imagine the ending of something we want. We can know the feeling of it if it be realized. So we can the reverse if we have already what we desired. So we know the feeling already. We can also know how to imagine the ending of it in our minds. The other is, if you know how you would feel, were you to realize your objective, then inversely you would know what state you would realize were you to awaken in yourself such feeling. The injection to pray, believing that you already possess what you pray for, is based upon a knowledge of the law of inverse transformation. So, if your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then inversely, that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Because all transformations of force are reversible, you should always assume the feeling of your fulfilled wish. You should awaken within yourself the feeling that you are and have already that which you desire to be and possess. This is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours if your objective was an accomplished fact, so that you live and move in the feeling that your wish is realized. The feeling of the wish fulfilled if assumed and sustained, must objectify the state that would have created it. This law explains why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and why he called things that are not seen 
as though they were seen, and things that were not seen become seen. So, assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and continue feeling that it is fulfilled until that which you feel objectifies itself. Because if a physical fact can produce a psychological state, also a psychological state can produce a physical fact. So we are told, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them and you shall have them. Thank you for watching this video and see you in the next one.